We're now going to begin using a bond graph and causality uh, to derive uh, the state equations for a system. And remember the form of the state equations that we will derive, uh, which is made convenient using a bond graph, is in the form of first order uh, differential equations in terms of the n states. So each equation, for example, x, uh, the ith equation x dot x being a state is going to be some function of of uh, possibly uh, all the states. Actually, and also I should uh, show in here also function of of the um, of the uh, of the inputs uh, u uh, to the system where j u sub j here where j would be one through say the number of inputs that you might have say r so um, now remember at least from a bond graph we can identify either momentum or displacement states um, and we'll write equations in terms of momentum and displacement but there can be times uh, that we might convert over into um, other states so for example you know if if you know for a mass we we know that momentum is related to the mass times the velocity we can derive the equation in terms of say p dot and you know whatever that is but we could also recognize that that's just mv dot and if we prefer to have the equation in terms of velocity we can then convert that over after we've derived the equations it's just more convenient to begin with the momentum states this way because we'll, we can easily write the rate relations as the state equations okay Right, so we're going to say that we're not done with right deriving equations until everything on the right-hand side is either states or inputs, or and of course system parameters, you know the different constants and so on. Um, we're not going to allow on the right-hand side any derivatives. We want everything on the right-hand side things that are determined in terms of state or input. Okay, or again constant parameters. We're going to focus on a lot of different types of systems. And the types of models that we can build with a bond graph, you know, there's a wide class. Um, we focus mostly, you know, at least up, up until now on Kirchhoff type systems, but later on I'm going to show you we can handle a lot of other type, types of systems. If, and um, there's a lot of advantage then because then we can derive the equations in the same way from the bond graph, despite what disciplinary area that we're looking at. Again, given that certain assumptions are made about the form of the system, you know, lump parameter, um, but no limitation really on the types of constitutive models that we can have and so on. You know, each problem is going to have certain difficulties. You know, building the bond graph sometimes, you know, that presents difficulties. All these are things that, you know, you learn how to do as, 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 you, uh, as you go along. Um, also, sometimes there's detailed development of constitutive relations that are required. As we move in, you know, after, again, we've understood how to build models, we'll start looking at doing some analysis and building some simulations there. The details of the parameterization of the, mo of the model and the use of constitutive relations becomes important. All those are details, but the, the key thing is that the derivation of the equations is going to become hopefully more consistent and reliable and uh, less uncertainty in that process. And two th key things help. One is that we can always begin again the state derivation using the rate relations from the independent energy storage elements and that can be found consistently using causality there's no more guessing as to what equations need to be derived that's always going to be known the other thing which I want to um, illustrate through some examples is that you can use the causality that that and uh, that you've uh, apply it onto the bonds to, to help guide you know, the actual algebra that you're using and I'll try to illustrate that as we move along and then that can save you a lot of time you know, you've gone through a lot of trouble in building the bond graph you might as well use it and use a causality uh, because there's a lot of information there we're going to begin really by studying what we call fully independent cases where you know we do if we do have energy storage elements you know they're all independent 
Okay, just so that we can learn how to do the process. Later we'll look at cases where we have derivative causality or possibly arbitrary assignments and then we have algebraic loops. We'll look at those in later lessons. And then we'll also possibly look at some cases where we don't have any energy storage elements at all. You know, those are cases where maybe you're trying to build a steady state model for a, a device. Okay, so for now we're going to focus on fully independent cases. So again, always go back to a nice simple problem to illustrate what we're going to do with the basic steps. We'll look at two simple examples here before we move on to some practical examples. Okay, first, in case you've got a simple mass with a force on it, and let's let, let friction here be linear. So we're going to say that the force um, on this mass, uh, you know, uh, uh, due to sliding is, is linear and there's some uh, a, lin a, uh, a damping coefficient B here. The ground is not moving. Uh, so as you can see, this velocity V sub B over here on the bond graph associated with this resistive element, and sorry, this right here should be should be a little B, shouldn't it? Um, and uh, that's the damping coefficient. This velocity B is, is, since this is on a one junction, is equal to V. We recognize that the ground's not moving, so the, the, the power, remember the power did be dissipated is FB times VB, and that velocity associated with the damping is, so, is, is, is equal to the velocity of the mass. So the structure of the model is pretty simple here. Don't really need a bond graph, but I just want to show you okay, how we use causality and then how we derive the equations from the bond graph. All right, so um, another little error in my graph here is that this should be uh, an effort source, not, not an F, okay? Um, and so here's a little effort source. Uh, this, uh, that's, that's the force here and um, got an I element here. So we need to apply causality uh, because that's an effort source there. So once we've done that, again, that's a one junction, so um, we have not applied any um, causality on any of these bonds that has imposed a flow yet, so we are free to choose the I element to impose flow because that gives us integral causality. So now this is, right, an independent energy storage element. And what does that mean? It means that P is a state. And in this case, it's only one state. And let's finish causality. This means that this causality is effort coming back from this friction. So this all makes sense. Basically, now the, your state vector is a, it's a first order, right, n equals 1 simple system. Uh, so we've got our state. Now, how do we derive equations? Well, remember, we always focus on... You know, so we have one independent energy storage element. We know what the state is, so we need to find the state equation for the, the one state that we have, which is P. So what is that state equation? Well, it's the rate relation for this element, which is P dot you know, equals whatever the force is that's basically coming into this I element from this one junction. And that net force right is basically equal to remember you, you know use your uh, uh, bond graph here and the sign convention now we've been talking about using causality but we haven't used sign convention now the sign comes in that net force here uh, which is equal to p dot is that difference right remember some of the efforts equals zero at this one junction so you can show that that gives you that p dot is equal to f of t minus f of b. Right hand side is in terms of an input, but fb needs to be replaced by state. That's equal to b times v, where v is equal to p over m. And once you substitute this back in here, you're done with your state equation. One order one, one state equation. And that's all you need. One more simple example is this little circuit that we looked at before. Here's the bond graph. There's no input sources, but we know that we can apply causality here, giving us independence. So our state, again, is order one, and it's Q sub C. So this is the only state equation we're going to need. Once I apply this effort here on this one, then this tells us that this one, this uh, R element is telling us the flow. So I'm going to be talking about this more as we work more examples, but 
you can you should learn to read the causality. So I'm going to write that here. Read causality. And what do I mean by that? Well, it means that when I ask, when I start writing the equations, I'm going to want to write this relation here, right? So let's do that. So the rate relation. So I want state my state equation is for QC is Q dot C equals that current I sub C, right? That's there. Now, what is I sub C? Well, you look at I sub C, and that's the current on this one junction. You need to read the causality, and as, as systems get more complex, it becomes a little less, I mean, it becomes more important to do that. Um, but you say, well, the, the current on that one junction, they're all the same as being determined causally, right, by this, by this bond. That means that you write this causally, which means I sub R is equal to, I'm sorry, I sub C is equal to I sub R. That's what this says, right? It's easy to see here, but we'll look at other examples where it may not, it may hopefully, you may hopefully see that it's very helpful to, to, to do this, to read the causality. Because then you save time in deriving and, and, you know, writing algebra. So now I focus on what is I sub R? What is I sub R? Well, I sub R is coming from this R element, and I use what the constitutive relation. This is a R here. If that's a linear resistance, sorry. if that's a linear resistance, then I sub R is just one over R times V sub R, right? Now, what is V sub R? Well, causally, V sub R comes from V sub C, but what? It's got the negative sign, right? So, I sub R is negative one over R times V C. Okay? It's important to, to read the sign convention. So, remember, all this is coming from the graph. Okay? Because you've put everything into the graph that you know comes from the physical laws. Now, at the end of the day, you write your state equation as, what is it, minus 1 over R sub C times Q sub C. Now, where did that come from? Because I know that V sub C is equal to 1 over C times Q sub C because it's in terms of, you know, that's my constitutive relationship for my capacitive element. And so there's my single my state equation. Again, this was order n equals 1. Now, as we start moving towards more complex systems, you know, um, as, as these very simple examples uh, are not really motivating us a whole lot to use a bond graph. They, we can work those using the basic methods that we learned about in our review of Kirchhoff systems. Um, but the point is that uh, we now have hopefully a way of guiding our equation development as well as identification of states from the bond graph and by using causality. Everything that you've put into the bond graph uh, can be used now to um, help guide how you derive equations and uh, I hope you'll see that it's much more consistent that way. Um, what I'm going to be calling causal paths is what I try to illustrate with that simple RC example is that by reading the causality uh, you, you, it can help you identify how variables are related to each other in a system. Uh, using um, you know, causality uh, on, on the various bonds. Using these causal paths uh, uh, is something that I'm going to try to emphasize and demonstrate through some of the examples that, that we'll be looking at in, 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 in subsequent videos.